Hi, I'm Lisa Simon, and we are in Meridius Gallery, and um, this is part of our holiday show for 2020. And I'm here with Hagrid Ferguson, a, a local Missoula artist who we represent and we've represented for years. And every holiday show, Hagrid brings us a group of paintings, and we get to talk about them. And this time I brought her, because of COVID and everything, we can't have a, a talk where we invite people in, so I've invited her here to talk about this group of paintings. So thank you for coming, Hagrid. And what can you tell us about this group of paintings that you've made for us? Well, thank you, Lisa. Thanks for inviting me today. I always love sharing my work, and thank you for having my work in the gallery. Uh, this is a fun group of paintings. I worked on it through the better part of the fall and the early part of the winter. And uh, over the summer, I, I spent a lot of time gathering photos that inspired me. And so one person I stumbled across uh, was his name is Briar Diggs. And he I contacted him and asked him, I love your work, can I can I use it for my my pieces this this upcoming season? And he said that he'd be more than happy to really share his images. So so a lot of these are based off of Briar Diggs photographs as well as a few that are from other people. In fact, I see there are a few pieces maybe from an earlier time um, that I, I worked on. And I, one of them may have been from Jeff Sutton's photography. So he's another photographer that I, I choose to work from. And you base these, um, so you base these on photos taken by friends or photographers, and they're mostly of this region, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think I recognize it all. Yeah. Um, but then, so what do you, you're taking the, the work of someone else, and these are people who are conscious photographers, so they're composing the scene. Yes. So how is it that you make that scene yours? How do you turn that photograph into a happy person? So a lot of times, um, it, sometimes it's about cropping the image. And in fact, I have an example I brought to show you. Mm -hmm. But it, it can be about cropping the image. Sometimes it's it's a little shift in the color. Sometimes I'll take a photograph and combine two totally separate photographs to make a scene. Um, so it really depends. Sometimes the photograph as it is is just really it speaks to me. And a lot of times when I get a photograph, I'm drawn to the colors. So you'll notice that with this collection, there is a huge emphasis on sky. But I, I feel like if you looked at all of these skies, every single sky has a little different color palette. So I really like to study color through the reflection of sky and how it plays on land. So if a photograph has a really dynamic color palette in that sense that I might be drawn to it. And then I, I will probably alter it as far as composition. Even though the photographer has their composition, it may work on a different shaped canvas for a painting. So so I'll alter that. And I an example I think you'll have a photo that can be pulled up, but this is camera, but this is the photograph I used for this image. And so I I cropped in and I also shifted the plane with where the horse is now smaller and and a little further away from the trees. So I I ended the sky in a slightly different color. I played with that a little bit. So so th this shows you that I really used this photograph, but I I altered it slightly. And your your process for painting is really distinct too. You, um, you can do a treatment on the, the canvas and then yeah. an underpainting and then something you call coloring, which sounds lots of fun. Yes, it is fun. <laughs> it's, it's like Christmas when I get the colors out. So so yes, I first just prep the canvas and I, I get a gel medium and I just do really um, thick brush strokes. So, so that way I'm trying to think of an example this um, one, the texture. That's a good one. Um, you can kind of see a canvas pattern, a brush stroke underneath with the paint. 
And that's not necessarily, I put on the feet that way, but it's how it's rubbed through the texture. So I get layers of color by having that texture. Great. And then you go from there to an underpainting, and you go yes. this is a nice I, example. Th this is something that I started many, many, many years ago, and I never, I never finished it, but it gives a great example of how all of these looked at one point. They all had this sepia brown tone, and then from this stage, they all the colors layered on top. And the, I, the color is many, many layers of that color. And then the final is the coloring itself. Yes. So, so really getting in that image is important because it, it will solidify the value structure, uh, the shapes, everything on the canvas. And then the color just brings all of that to life. Hmm. And then in this, the coloring, um, you're, you've chosen dawn and dusk for most yes. of them. So these are transitional hours. Mm -hmm. There's a, a really lot of value difference. Um, what, what attracted you to that time of day, the magic hours? The magic hours, probably the colors. <laughs> Definitely the color. But I also love how, um, if you compare these two images right here, these two are actually the same location. And, um, and, a, and this is a morning image, and this is an evening image. And I just wanted to show how the skylight can dramatically change the whole scene. And I also painted it so if they were side by side, but the horizon line is exactly the same level on the canvas. So, so they could be considered a side by side pair. Uh, but but the but I just love the way this hour of the day you get so much color transition from bright orange to blue. If you were to put these two colors right next to each other, it just it's just amazing to me that the sky can have that many colors in it. And the same with that, even though it's it's not the same dramatic orange and, and blues, there are just so many different color values in just the, the subtle creams to the blues. Mm. We, I remember you once told me that you used to be afraid of color. Yes. This does not seem to be a fear you have anymore. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> what happened? I don't know what happened. <laughs> so I started out uh, when I went to school, I did everything to avoid color. I was a drawer, I, I, every, all my work, I, I was a sculpture major, and I would mix in drawing, so I, I was really, really good at drafting anything, but that's always black and white. And so, um, whenever I put the color on, it just freaked me out, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand how to value the color. And it was really just a process of continually painting, and over the years, my palette started to develop. I had a real muted palette, it's a, a good example of that, um, but it was designed to be like that. Are the murals on the games of Broadway, but they were designed to have a full photograph feel. But that worked me into using color. Uh -huh. And then I just kept building on that and getting more and more bold, and, and it's developed into this. And, and, I, and I love color now, I can't imagine. Not <laughs> and it sounds like um, what you're describing is uh, a really active intellectual life after school with yes. yourself. How much is self-taught in what you do? As far as the painting goes, I would say it's almost all self-taught because I, I took a couple painting classes when I was at the university, but I did everything to avoid actually painting. I would make a sculpture and I'd paint it. So, so then when I moved to Portland, Oregon, I got a job and I worked as a painter for a company called the Minimums. And it's, it's really fun. It was uh, just a lot of design-oriented stuff, so it was really easy for me to work into 
Money with me because it was real two dimensional, mm -hmm. and uh, and so then as I started to get more comfortable with that, I I branched out and and it, it, it's been a process. So I don't know how many years that, that we're at right now, but over twenty years of developing that skill. Hmm. And these are also um, pretty small paintings. What yes. do you like about painting small? Uh, they're very intimate, and um, I find that I, in some ways, I can focus in on the drama more with the smaller palette than the bigger palette. Mm -hmm. And there is something very special about about working on small scale for me, um, versus just. Now, I've done big, big, big paintings. Yeah, we've done murals. Yes, and. and they're wonderful. They have their own their own uh, place, and, and I enjoy it. But I, I find this very special and intimate. And I I didn't mention, but we have a, a big mural in um, Missoula of Hadley's at the corner of Broadway and Higgins, and then um, you also have major murals in the Capitol Building in Helena. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? Yes, that was an exciting one. That one is that the murals are about the history of women in Montana. And it actually went through the legislative process to be able to have a, a, a bid to get the murals completed. And they did a nationwide search, and luckily I got picked as an artist to do it. Wow. And what was really wonderful um, is I, I got to research the history of women in Montana from the, those murals really focus on the 1890s through about the 1930s. And I completed them in my home. And my daughter at the time was just seven years old. So she got to come up and weekly see these women of all on the canvas and learn about these stories, which was just a special thing to share with her. Yes, because most of the, and it's a special thing to share with everyone, because yeah. women's lives, as they're tradi traditionally depicted in the story of the West, are very minor roles. So what was the capital like before this? So before these murals, there were not a lot of women. In the art, if the artwork, if you walk around the capital, it's all men. There were a few women here and there, referenced to Jeanette Rankin, uh, and, but, but that was one of the issues, and that's why they thought through this process, so that we would have some sense of history about what the women were doing. And it was also really important, the bill was written, so that there is not a specific women, woman in the murals. So genetic ranking is not part of these murals. It is just about women in general and the lives and what they did and how they historically contributed to the state. That's really important because it's the it's the women who are left out of history. Yeah. And in a way you brought them from that voiceless position that they held into visual depictions, even if we don't know their names. Yes. That's so super important. And and, and it was really it was my hope that that any young girl, any, any woman going to the Capitol can see themselves possibly in those murals, that they didn't have to be a famous figure to be part of the history, that they are history, that we are all history currently. Very nice. And I do think that that leads back to these paintings that you've done for us, because, you know, women have often um, had control of the domestic space mm -hmm. and small paintings um, and how you describe these as intimate paintings, mm -hmm. that does sort of represent the home and how, especially in this 2020, how we are all now in our homes a lot and thinking about the ideas that we're bringing into those spaces and art is such a big part of that. I agree with you. I think it, it really is important, and, and, uh, and it, it's always a wonderful opportunity to, to think about these, these spaces. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I hope you come down to see these paintings at Radius Gallery. They're up until December 30th.
I want to thank Hadley for being here with us and, and talking about them, and really appreciate you stopping by. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you.